Hi and welcome to this webinar that's going to take you through what to do now you've been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. My name is Katie Phillips and I'm a specialist community dietitian. And my name is Celia Mannering, I'm also a specialist community dietitian. So before we move on to the main part of the webinar, I'm just going to take you through some symptoms that aren't typically connected to IBS. So these are blood in your stools, unexplained weight loss, unexplained low iron levels, persistent changes of bowel habits, vomiting or severe nausea. So if you're experiencing any of these symptoms, please go and speak with your GP. Another thing to consider is if you've had a history of anxiety associated to food and eating, or if you're suffering from any other health conditions that compromise your nutritional status, please seek specialist dietetic support and because then we can think about your diet in a more holistic way and all your different medical conditions. Just before we move on to the webinar, I just want to take you through some of the information sheets that you would have been sent through email. They are listed on the screen. So what I'd advise you doing is just having a look through these and either printing or downloading the ones that are relevant to you, because we will be referencing these throughout the webinar. What will be covered today is I'm going to take you through what is IBS, also what are the symptoms connected with IBS, and then Celia is going to take you through dietary steps you can make and other information which includes probiotics and other dietary interventions you can do. And then I'm going to finish off the webinar about talking about lifestyle changes. So before we move on to understanding what dietary steps you can take, I'm just going to take you through what is IBS. So I'm sure after you were diagnosed with IBS, you may have searched the internet to understand how to better manage your symptoms. There is an array of information that can sometimes be overwhelming and confusing. IBS is a long-term condition that has no specific cause, no distinctive pathology and no single effective treatment. It affects about 10 to 20 percent of the UK population. Symptoms can vary from person to person, but also in that same individual can vary significantly and can often be a response to what happens in our diet and lifestyle. Symptoms can be triggered after periods of physical and emotional stress. And studies have shown the gut in IBS individuals tends to be more sensitive and reactive, which is where the term irritable comes from. It is shown to be more common in women than in men and can often be triggered from a period of physical illness, such as gastroenteritis, food poisoning, or as a response to some medication. So here are some of the symptoms that typically we see with for people with IBS. So we've got at the top, you can see constipation, mixed bowel movements, that's constipation and diarrhea, or diarrhea. There's also urgency to open your bowels, wind, which includes belching and flatulence, abdominal pain and discomfort, as well as bloating. You may experience one of these symptoms or you may experience it, you may be experiencing a range of these symptoms. But the main thing to have a look at and what we want to understand as professionals is what's happening with your bowels. So you can see on the screen that we have circled type three to type five on the Bristol stool chart. And this is what we use when we're with individuals in clinic, because what we understand is what we want to understand is what is normal for you, because what is normal for you might not be normal for someone else. So type three to type five is a normal bowel movement. Type one to type two is what we would deem to be constipation. And type six to type seven is what we'd be deemed to be diarrhea. With regards to frequency, every two days or two times a day might be typical for you. The main thing we are wanting to understand is if there's been any noticeable in changes. So for example, if you usually go once a day and it's type five to type six, but then it changes to going every three to uh, three to four times a day and it's mainly type six. This, this would be the abnormal bowel movement. So just to finish on a question, is seeing blood in your stools a typical symptom for IBS? Yes or no? Just take a minute to think about that. So the answer to this is no. And if you are seeing blood in your stools, please go and see your GP. So what I'm going to do now is just hand over to Celia, who's going to take you through dietary steps you can make to help manage your IBS symptoms. Thanks for that, Katie. So we're now going to have a look at what you can do to manage your symptoms. 
I'm going to start off by talking about bloating, which may be accompanied by excessive wind and abdominal discomfort or cramps. Patients that I see in clinic often describe bloating as their stomach getting much bigger throughout the day and their waistband getting tighter. They also describe it as a stretching sensation in their stomach or a feeling of fullness. If you have these symptoms, the following may help. Increase your intake of soluble fibre. When we eat foods containing soluble fibre, it's broken down in the gut and it forms a gel-like substance, which can help to soften and also help to form the stool. And so eating more soluble fibre may make it easier to pass a stool and this can help to improve bloating. A good source of soluble fibre is golden linseeds. So you could try adding up to a tablespoon of linseeds to your cereal or your yoghurt. And it's also important that you increase your fluid intake when you have uh, linseeds. Oats are another good source of soluble fibre. So if you like porridge, that's a really good breakfast to have. Now, we know that certain foods do cause us to produce more gas. And so you could try reducing your intake of some of these foods. We often find that beans, so something like kidney beans or baked beans, uh, and also foods such as peas, chickpeas, sweet corn, lentils, they can increase bloating. Some people find that eating broccoli, sprouts, cabbage and cauliflower make them more gassy. So you might want to reduce your intake of these foods, but just try it for a couple of weeks to see if it makes any difference to your symptoms. If it doesn't help, it's really important you put them back in your diet as we don't want you to restrict your diet unnecessarily. And of course, these foods that I've just mentioned are really nutritious. So we don't want you avoiding them if you don't need to. Let's talk a little bit about sugar free products, in particular those that include the sugar alcohols. So that's things such as sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol. So basically those sweeteners that end in OL. These can make your symptoms worse. So check the packets and avoid. Again, just try it for a couple of weeks to see if it makes any difference to your symptoms. There are other sweeteners that you can use in the meantime that are not sugar alcohols and they won't have this, uh, they won't cause this effect to your gut. Some people find that carbonated drinks can make wind and bloating worse. So again, have a trial period without them to see if that helps. And do take a look at the BDA diet sheet attached to the email that we sent you for more information about this. So Katie has previously explained what constipation is. And if this is one of your symptoms, the focus should be on increasing your uh, fiber and fluid. Our digestive system uses a large volume of fluid every day just to keep the gut working properly. We need to drink about two liters of fluid a day which works out to be about eight glasses or cups of fluid. If we don't drink enough and we become dehydrated, more water will be reabsorbed from the large intestine, leaving the feces in your colon dried out and hard, which can result in constipation. A good guide as to whether you have an adequate fluid intake is to check the colour of your urine. It should be a pale straw colour. And if it's darker than this, it could be a sign of dehydration. Although we recommend increasing your fibre intake, if you have constipation, um, we don't recommend using wheat bran. Um, this can sometimes make your IBS symptoms worse. However, other types of fibre, uh, it's a good idea to try to increase those. So things such as whole grain foods, and um, that would be things like granary bread or seeded bread, nuts and seeds, fruit and veg. Um, as you know, the recommendation for fruit and veg is to have at least five a day um, and of course that's for somebody that doesn't have constipation so if you have constipation it's fine to increase up to seven eight even nine portions a day and um, this can also include dried fruits for example prunes can, uh, they're a really great natural laxative um, I should say here, though, just a word of caution, do increase the amount gradually, as sometimes increasing your fibre can cause a worsening of other symptoms such as bloating. And while we're on the subject of fruit, I'll just quickly talk about what a portion is. So one portion of fruit would be something like one apple or one orange or what will fit in the palm of your hand. If it's something like berries, let's say. Um, and if and for vegetables, it's about three tablespoons. That's that's about 80 gram is what a, one portion would be. 
So also, as well as the fruit and veg, you can include oats and linseeds. As we said before, they're a great source of fibre. So let's say something like porridge with a few prunes and some linseeds. That'd be a really great breakfast for somebody with constipation. And just to remind you that we have an information sheet for constipation, which would have been sent with your email. So do print that off if you need it. If your symptoms are more in the other direction, so if they are predominantly diarrhoea, there are certain things you can try. We would suggest limiting spicy foods such as curries, chilli peppers, paprika, because these can irritate the gut. Uh, however, for as with all the other suggestions, they don't cause a problem for everyone with IBS. So have a trial period of limiting them. But if it makes no difference, then there's no need to continue restricting it's also worth remembering that these types of dishes, as well as containing spices, they also contain onion and garlic, which are high FODMAP foods. And so it could be due to these ingredients rather than to the chilies or the spices that are causing those symptoms. And we will talk briefly about what the low FODMAP diet is a little later on. Another thing that we recommend uh, you can do if you have diarrhea is to reduce the amount of fibre that you eat. It's still important that you have fruit and veg, but choose the ones lower in fibre, such as carrots and parsnips, um, you know, maybe peel the things, fruit, you know, for example, something like an apple, uh, remove the seeds maybe, um, and maybe restrict fruit to no more than two portions a day. Also avoid whole grain varieties of foods. So, for example, uh, you could have white bread, uh, instead of the, the the whole whole grain breads and choose a breakfast cereal with less fiber in so something such as corn flakes rather than bran flakes i know this might sound contradictory to the usual health healthy eating advice uh, that that's given but if you're having a lot of diarrhea cutting down on the fiber often really helps again it's a it's a good idea to make any changes gradually and that's to avoid going the other way and becoming constipated. You could also try reducing your caffeine intake. Because caffeine is a stimulant, it can stimulate the bowel to move food through it more quickly, which you don't want to happen if you have diarrhoea. Try limiting your caffeine intake to two or three cups of coffee a day, although some people seem to find that even one cup will affect their symptoms. Sometimes people say to me, if I have one cup of coffee, I'm absolutely fine. But if I have more, I'm rushing off to the loo. So if caffeine is a problem for you, it's a case of finding your own tolerance level to caffeine. And don't forget that it is in tea and energy drinks too. Also avoid sugar alcohols. We've spoken about those previously. If you look at the small print on these products, you will often see that they warn that these products can have a laxative effect. You know that one treatment doesn't fit all and often there's some trial and error element of finding out what works best for you. It may be the type of food that you are eating that are contributing to your symptoms. However, it may be more to do with your lifestyle or your eating patterns. And so there's a few things that you can try to help alleviate your symptoms. Ensure that you have a regular eating pattern and try to avoid missing meals. Your gut gets get used to having um, a frequency of meals coming in and this can aid digestion. It's also best if you can avoid eating too late at night as this can increase symptoms such as reflux. Avoid excessively large meals as digesting all that food in one go if you have a really big meal gives your gut a lot of work to do. Eating larger meals is more likely to cause bloating, excess wind and reflux. As has already been mentioned, ensure that you're having plenty of fluids throughout the day to ensure that you stay well hydrated. You might want to try limiting high fat foods such as fried foods, cream, takeaways, cheese, sausages, those sorts of foods, because too much fat in the diet can cause loose bowel movements. If possible, it's a good idea to cook fresh meals from scratch. Uh, that way you can decide what goes in them and you can minimise the amount of fat that they contain. So alcohol, we know, can be an irritant to the gut and limiting it can help IBS symptoms to improve. The slide here shows the upper limit of alcohol intake per week. Regarding alcohol, the Chief Medical Officer's guideline for both men and women recommends that it's safest not to drink more than 14 units of alcohol a week. So 
that's no more than two units a day. Uh, two units would be approximately one pint of fairly low strength beer or um, a 150 ml glass of wine. Again, it, it does depend on the strength of the wine. Um, that's the advice for everybody regarding alcohol, whether you've got IBS or not. Um, the reason we talk about it here is because, like I say, for some people, this, this is an irritant when they've, when they've got IBS. If you'd like more information about alcohol, have a look at the NHS website under alcohol units. So we have a question now on the screen. Question is, if your symptoms are mostly constipation, should you reduce fibre in your diet? I'll just give you a second to think about that. And the answer is no. If you have constipation, you need to increase your fibre. Sometimes the bacteria in our gut can get knocked out of balance for many different reasons. So, for example, things like taking antibiotics or having food poisoning. I want to talk a little bit about these probiotic products now. They're available in health food shops or supermarkets and they are a, a source of good bacteria and may be able to help with the symptoms of IBS. We tend to think that bacteria are harmful germs that spoil our food or and, and make us ill, and, and of course they do do this, but the, there are good bacteria in our gut, um, and these help us to digest fibre, and they, they help to keep the gut healthy. Although studies around probiotics so far have been small and inconclusive, there is limited evidence that certain probiotics may help to reduce IBS symptoms, particularly in somebody whose IBS seemed to start as a result of gastroenteritis or food poisoning. There was some recent research that showed that probiotics, which contain several different bacteria, so these are called multi-strain probiotics, um, they seem to provide benefit for people with IBS. But the products that you can see on the screen have some limited evidence of a beneficial effect for people with IBS. And so if you are going to try a probiotic product, you may wish to try one of these products. If you do decide to try one, um, you need to take it for at least four weeks. So I'm going to talk about lactose now. So sometimes people with IBS remove dairy from their diet and see an improvement in symptoms and they think that they have a problem with dairy. But it's most likely that it's the lactose in the milk that is causing the problem. And so all they need to do is to reduce the lactose. So lactose is an, uh, a natural occurring sugar found in milk and milk products. Some people lack or have weak activity of the enzyme in their gut. Um, it's called lactase and lactase breaks down the sugar lactose. That means that the lactose builds up in the gut and can cause symptoms such as bloating and diarrhea. And that's because the bacteria that colonize the gut have to break down the lactose. When the gut bacteria break down the lactose, the bacteria produce gas, which can cause bloating and wind and can also lead to osmotic diarrhea um, as it causes water to be drawn into the bowel. So if so, so who should really try a low lactose diet? Well, we, we'd recommend if you've noticed symptoms after consuming lactose, um, lactose containing products, um, uh, or if you've suffered symptoms following a bout of, say, gastroenteritis or food poisoning, it, it might be worth you giving it a go. You could try it for a couple of weeks and see if it helps. However, it's really important if there's no improvement that you reintroduce lactose back into the diet after the two weeks. And that's because, you know, there's really no benefit to restrict to, you know, restricting your diet unnecessarily. Um, and it could result in some nutritional deficiencies. So, for example, you know, milk's a really good source of calcium. So have a look at the low lactose diet sheet for more information that you, you were sent with the email if you think lactose may be a problem. Uh, this diet sheet also includes some alternative sources of calcium. So do I need to follow a gluten free diet? So people often ask whether they should cut, cut gluten out of their diet if they have IBS. So we'll look at that in a little bit more detail now. Gluten is a protein found in wheat, rye and barley. Gluten must be avoided by people who have celiac disease because they have an autoimmune response to gluten. Symptoms of IBS and celiac disease can be quite similar. And so before you were diagnosed with IBS, 
your GP or consultant should have ruled out celiac disease. The initial investigation for this is uh, usually a blood test. If you don't think this has been done, we would recommend that you ask your GP whether celiac disease has been ruled out. And if, um, if you do need to have a blood test for celiac disease, don't take gluten out of your diet before that blood test, otherwise the, the results won't be accurate. So gluten is not connected to IBS. However, wheat, rye and barley, as well as containing gluten, also contain something called fructans. Now, fructans are fermented by the bacteria in our gut. And for some people, this can cause IBS symptoms. So sometimes people find that their symptoms are worse after eating wheat, rye or barley and blame it on the gluten when, in fact, it may be the fructans causing the problem. So if you have found a problem after eating wheat, rye or barley and celiac disease has been ruled out, a low FODMAP diet may help to improve your symptoms. So you may have heard of the low FODMAP diet. FODMAPs is a name given to a particular group of fermentable carbohydrates that tend to aggravate gut symptoms in sensitive people. A low FODMAP diet involves reducing the amount of fermentable carbohydrates that you eat. Research has shown that for people with IBS who have tried the low FODMAP diet, about 70% of those have experienced significant improvements to their symptoms. The low FODMAP diet includes an exclusion phase where certain foods are avoided for four to six weeks and then systematically reintroduced in order to find out which types of FODMAPs that you can tolerate. Sometimes people think that they need to avoid these foods long term, but it's, it's, it's really important that these foods are not avoided long term as FODMAPs are important for our gut health. So once you've tried the various things that we've suggested on this webinar, if you are still experiencing symptoms, you may want to try a low FODMAP diet. If you do, we recommend that you do this with the help of a specialist dietitian. If you wish to do that, you can complete the self-referral form attached to your email and send it back to us um, and we can get you booked in to see a specialist dietitian as soon as possible. We'd much prefer that you did the low FODMAP diet with our help rather than by yourself. I'm now going to hand you back to Katie, who's going to talk about lifestyle changes. Great. So Celia's taken you through a wide variety of dietary changes you can make, and we recommend doing those for a four to six week period. And we have found with patients in the past that doing and completing a food and symptom diary is really helpful and it helps you evaluate your diet and lifestyle to see what is actually impacting your symptoms and when your symptoms are worse. So you can see on the screen, this is just an example of one day that you um, can fill in. And we have included this in on the email that we have sent you. So. Once you have identified a pattern, that would give you a good idea of what changes to make. But also, once you've made the changes, you can see whether that's had an impact on your symptoms. So moving on, I'm going to take you through different lifestyle changes that you can make to help improve specific symptoms. So first of all, we've got sitting position on the toilet. So this is connected to people that are suffering from constipation. And sometimes your sitting position on the toilet can help encourage bowel movement. So you can see the picture on the screen, but also we've got the downloadable constipation resource that takes you through um, what sitting position to do to help encourage bowel movement. Also, taking regular activity can help. It not, it not only has benefit with our bowel movement, but acts as a stress reliever, which can help improve IBS symptoms. And it's recommended to do at least 150 minutes a week of moderate activity. And moderate activity means that it gets your heart rate up and you start to feel sweaty and out of breath. Also, as well, it's about taking time to eat. So try not to eat on the go and have a digital free zone. It gives you a chance to have a relaxing eating environment, allowing your body to start digestion gently. Also, some people find benefit in other ways to relax. So this is mindfulness exercises, and this includes meditation or yoga. And finally, there are other services you can use that may help relieve some worries in your life that which which could be impacting your symptoms. And I'm going to take you through those now. 
So these services um, have trained therapists to help support people with long-term physical conditions. And these are people that may be struggling with sleep, worry, low mood, or just managing their long-term condition. So there's some question on, questions on the screen that I want you to think about. And if you answer yes to any of these questions, therapeutic support can help. So this is, have you been feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge? Not being able to stop or control worrying? Been feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? Had little interest or pleasure in doing things? So the services are relevant to your area. So you can see there's three services on the screen. Mind, Mind Matters is for individuals who are registered with a GP in Camberley, Frimley, Bagshot and Virginia Water. There's a website on the screen or a telephone number. And this is also included in the email we sent you. Talk Plus is for anyone registered with a GP in Aldershot, Farnborough, Fleet, Farnham or Yateley. And then finally, Talking Therapies is a service for individuals registered with a GP in Slough, Windsor, Ascot, Maid Maidenhead or Bracknell. So finally, in summary, we want you to try the changes that Celia suggested on the webinar for four to six weeks. And if that then doesn't help your symptoms, we'd like you to refer directly to a specialist dietitian and just download the one to one ref self referral form. Focus on reducing your intake of alcohol, caffeine, spicy foods and high fat foods. Modify, modify your diet based on your symptoms. So that's using the food and symptom diary to help you evaluate that. We want you to sit down to eat, relax, enjoy your food and have a digital free zone. Try the low lactose diet if your symptoms worsen after having lactose containing products. And finally, make one change at a time. So you can you can know which is actually impacting and helping your symptoms. And just to summarise and what I mentioned at the start is some symptoms that aren't connected to IBS and you can see them on the screen. Please go and speak with your GP if you are experiencing any of these symptoms. And just to summarise the information you received on our email. So you received a low lactose fact sheet, a constipation advice fact sheet a blank food and symptom diary, an IBS dietary fact sheet, a self-referral form for specialist dietetic support and a, a website link to the IBS network. So as I mentioned, if this, if the, the advice that Celia has given you doesn't help improve your symptoms after four to six weeks, we would like you to refer yourself to a specialist dietitian. And this is for individuals in these areas, Ascot, Bracknell, Farnham, Maidenhead, North East Hampshire, Slough, Surrey Heath and Windsor. If you live outside of these areas, please go and speak with your GP and get referred to a local dietitian. So all you need to do, do is download the self-referral form, complete it and email it back to us. And one final question. If this advice doesn't work after four to six weeks, I can refer myself to see a specialist dietitian. Is this true or false? So as I just mentioned, of course you can just download the self-referral form and send it over to us on email. But thank you so much for taking the time to watch this webinar. We hope it's been useful. But one final thing before you go, please complete the survey monkey for post webinar and you'll be you'll you can find this in the description box. It gives you a chance just to give us feedback and then we can help develop this webinar further based on your feedback. But thank you in advance for doing that.